You're listening to Good to Grow, a podcast for budding green thumbs. We'll dig into the fun, frustration, and science of growing your own food and flowers in Alberta. For even more tips, join our Facebook community, AMA Good to Grow. Hi, I'm your host, Sandra Speronis, and welcome to the second episode of Good to Grow. Gardening starts with the soil. Vegetables need good soil so we can enjoy delicious harvests. How do you keep your soil healthy? Chelsea Anderson has all the dirt. She's the owner and operator of Chelsea's Garden Soilutions in Calgary. She's also the co-author of the three-year Gardener's Gratitude Journal and a regular contributor to CTV Calgary's Morning Show. Welcome, Chelsea, to Good to Grow. Thanks for having me. So I'm still a beginner in the in the garden, and I always get overwhelmed by all the soil choices when I go to a garden center. What's the difference between potting soil, garden soil, and topsoil? Well, potting soil is really not a soil at all. It's like a potting mix. So it's basically peat moss mixed with perlite, um, and that's basically it. <laughs> Whereas a, a garden soil is, is made up of clay, silt, and sand. So it's a natural mix of these things, plus some organic matter, plus it has air and water in it. And that's really what's going to start growing things. Um, a topsoil is, is basically the same thing. Uh, it's just marketed differently than a garden soil would be, you know, so there's, there's just different terms that people use to try to make you want to buy it more. So a, to- a top soil and a garden soil are basically the same thing. Gotcha. So when would I use potting soil? Just for containers? Yeah, potting soil, or I like to call it potting mix because there is no soil in it. So it's a soil uh material, I guess, or medium. Um, so you'd use it often when you're doing pots. Um, so for annuals, for example, you put them in pots then, or when you're trying to start some seedlings, or trying to pot up some things in your house, that's the kind that, that's the time when you use potting soil. But there really is no nutrition in it. So there's really nothing nothing that really sustains the plant. So as a result, when you're using potting mix, you need to add in something else. And so when I use it, I often add in um, worm castings, for example, or you could use a, another type of fertilizer, like a, a chemical fertilizer, if that's what you're after. But um, the worm castings really add a nice balance and it adds some nice minerals and it adds some nice organic matter. So that really fills in the gap. And where do you get the worm castings? Just at a garden center as well? Garden centers, yeah, the, the, more and more so they are available at garden centers. And when I'm talking about garden centers, I'm not talking about Walmart or, or Canadian Tire. I'm talking about like a proper garden only center, if you know what I mean by that. Yeah. Um, there are some people online as well who are selling it. Um, so you can look online for, for like a local seller. There are lots of kind of small small operations in that sense. So if you look in your local area for worm castings, you can often find that sort of thing. And what exactly do worm castings do for your soil? Well, worm casting, well, first of all, maybe I shouldn't tell you what worm castings are. It's actually worm poop. So (laughs) if you raise worms and they're raised indoors, it's an indoor pet, essentially, and you feed them all of your organic material from your house or from your home or your kitchen, like your kitchen scraps or your leaves that are outside, you put all those into the worm bin and the worms eat them all up and they poop out this miracle poop. Uh, which we call worm castings. And what they do for the garden, I always talk about the three M's just to keep it kind of straightforward. So so M number one would be the microbes. They add a ton of microbes to the soil. And the microbes are super valuable because they help to feed your plants. They help to adjust the the levels of everything in your soil. So they're, they're really, really beneficial in that sense. So you add the microbes, which is the first M. They add moisture, which is they help retain moisture, I, sh- I should say. So you can add just a, a millimeter there was a study done at Old College which said that if you add a millimeter of worm castings to the top of your lawn, for example, you can water up to 70% less, and that's 70% less. So microbes, moisture, and minerals. So it's essentially like a, an organic fertilizer in that sense because you get all those perfectly balanced minerals in your soil, and you don't cause any trouble to your plants. So sometimes with chemical minerals, for example, you might add too much of it, and it might burn your plants or damage your plants in some way. But with worm castings, you're never going to add too much. You're never going to damage them. So they add those minerals. So those are the three M's, the minerals, the microbes, and the moisture. And I'll add a fourth M then. Uh, Worm castings are a bit of a miracle. A bit of a miracle. Thanks for the fourth M. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So if I plan on growing a garden in the ground, do I necessarily even even need to buy soil to grow good vegetables? You know, a lot of people want to buy soil, but there there isn't a lot of really good soil on the market, or not from what I've seen, and I, I hate to say that, because maybe there is some out there that I'm not aware of, but often when I go to the garden center, they'll say there's loam. Uh, they have these mixes, like these garden mixes, they're called. So there'll be loam, there'll be peat moss, and there'll be perlite. So that's almost entirely, and compost is usually what they add. So that's almost entirely 
just a potting mix, that there is a little bit of loam in there. So I don't even find those to be that great. I'm, I'm not really thrilled with that. Um, there is another way you can get it where they, they kind of, you know, as they build new neighborhoods outside of cities, they shovel off all the topsoil that already exists, like all the farmland topsoil, and they will sell that to you in bags. Uh, so that's a possibility, and that's like a nice product. But often the best soil that we can get our hands on is what already exists in our garden. And so sometimes clients will say, can you come over and remove all this soil and replace it with better soil? And like, there's nothing better than what you already have. You just have to learn how to amend that soil, how to make it better or how to kind of enrich it so that it will grow plants better. But you already have all those parts. You have that clay, that silt, that sand, and it's already in a loam-like format, which means it has all three of those parts in in more or less well-balanced uh, proportions. So right. what you really need to add is some organic matter of some sort. So that could be in the shape of worm castings, or it could be in the shape of compost, for example, which would add a lot of organic matter. Uh, that being said, if you're on a tight budget or if you're really interested in natural gardening, which is something that I'm super passionate about, you can add things like just the leaves that are falling from your trees can be added. That's organic matter. And if you then have the microbiology in that soil, so if you have this rich population already in there, if you have those worms that, that come naturally to gardens, um, then they will start to break those leaves down and they'll poop out the perfect amendment for your soil. So you really, you don't need to spend any money, but um, you do need to add something. So you need to add some kind of protective layer, which is the leaves or the mulch that you purchase. And then the worms and the microbes will do the rest. Okay. So I think you touched on this a bit before, but when you're amending your soil, what kind of nutrients are you actually adding to it? Well, I, I mean, I sound like a broken record when I say this, but compost and worm castings are the best amendment. So no matter what your soil is doing, if it's a really, really high pH, which in Calgary, we tend to be quite high on the pH levels, or if it's really low, so you have acidic soil, either way, the the compost or the worm castings are going to balance that out. If you have really clay sand, like really sticky clay filled sand, or soil, sorry, um, the best amendment is worm castings or compost. Again, if you have really sandy soil, the best thing is worm castings or compost. So it's always the same amendment. And now I've forgotten what your question was, because I think I'm going off track here. What kind of nutrients are you actually adding to the soil? Right, the nutrients. So then you're adding, when you add the compost or the worm castings, you're adding a really wide range of things. So you're adding basically whatever has come, say, let's say the leaves are broken down to make that compost. Whatever was in that tree that made those leaves that then fell on the ground that then broke down, those are the minerals that you're adding. And so what tends to happen in, in, a, in a well-made compost pile is that you tend to end up with a really wide range of minerals and lots of the really funny little ones. Like, so you'll add, be adding things like zinc or copper or magnesium or any of those funny little minerals that we wouldn't tend to add if we were adding it in a fertilizer type shape. But the, the best part is that they're in a well-balanced format. So you're never getting too much calcium added or you're never getting too much um, copper or whatever it is. It's always really nicely balanced because it's already a perfect mix in that sense. Right. Yeah. How do you go about testing your pH levels? Oh, uh, you can just get like pH strips, I suppose, and you can stick them in and they give you more or less uh, a good indicator of, of where you're at. Again, if I can speak locally to Calgary. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> If you're in Calgary, your pH is going to be high. So it's going to be between 7.2 is the lowest I've seen it to about 7.8. And um, other other areas of the province are much higher. So even Edmonton is quite a bit, or sorry, much lower. They'll have a more acidic soil if you go uh, anywhere outside of Calgary, basically. Because we have really high calcium levels in Calgary because we have all these mineral deposits that were left here naturally and we naturally have lots of calcium in the soil. So that makes the pH really high here, but in other places it will be more, probably more balanced or slightly more acidic. Um, but again, no matter where, where your uh, pH level is sitting, the amendment is more casting to compost. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you know what kind of soil you have? You can test it. Um, one of the, the little tricks is if you have slightly damp soil, you can kind of roll it between your, your hands to make like a, a worm, like as if you're a kid playing with Play-Doh. You kind of roll it out to make a worm. And if it really sticks together and makes that worm, <laughs> then you have high clay content. But if it's breaking up more, if it's kind of splitting apart, if it's gritty, that means it's more sand, for example. So you'll sit somewhere in that clay silt sand uh, triangle. And it'll be become it'll become quite obvious as you play with it. Like you actually do have to handle your soil. And this is so like I often say things like just put your finger in the soil to test for moisture, or just put your finger in the soil to test for this or that. And um, your hands can actually tell you quite a bit about the content of your soil. Um, I often see really 
dry and dusty soil as well. And that right away, I know that that's low organic matter in that soil. So that, that doesn't speak to the clay filter sand, but that just means you have low organic matter, which means that nothing's going to grow really well there. It, it doesn't have that. It, it's probably lacking the biology, but it's also lacking kind of the food source or the, or the good organic mix that you need to have things grow in there. So it's really dusty. If you feel like a big wind would come and blow away your garden, uh, if it's dust bowl conditions, you know, that needs to be amended. And, and that's when you really need to get a good thick layer of compost to put on the top of your soil. Right. Chelsea, how did you become so passionate about soil? Oh, well, I grew up with a mom who's a, a gardener and she always grew organic food for us. So I always understood the value of organic. So I never considered chemical, but that was always kind of out of my repertoire. And then as I started to work, uh, when I started my, I had a little gardening business and when I started doing it, I was just by myself in the garden and I would just sit there and just think about these things by myself. I've got a philosophy degree, so, you know, thinking about things in my head. But as I started to kind of watch how nature works, I started to get curious about nature and how she does it without fertilizing ever. So Mother Nature never, never adds fertilizer. And I was wondering how she does that. And I started to pay attention to what she does in order to amend the soils of the earth, um, and you'll notice that in nature, there are never any bare patches. So you never see, like in, in, in gardens, in your front garden, you probably have bare soil <laughs> around. And people often think that that looks beautiful, which it does to a, to a degree. It looks like it's organized and, and well-planned. But you'll notice that in nature, she never, Mother Nature never does that. And so she's always covered up every piece of land with something that's growing, unless there's been some kind of trauma, such as an earthquake or a, or a landslide or something like that. And so first of all, she covers all the land. So that means all the plants are... Uh, photosynthesizing and they're putting those sugars into the soil and they're naturally attracting the biology that comes to have those sugars because everybody wants a a taste of that sugar and that's what the plant is good at doing is making sugar Um, the other thing she does is when she she drops leaves for example she then leaves them on site and that creates not only habitat for a lot of the beneficial critters so things like ground beetles or lady beetles they love that sort of environment under leaves where they can stay cozy in the winter and where they can stay protected in, during the summer. And then the other thing she does is she has these decomposers that exist who come and they eat these things and they poop out this beautiful organic matter. So things such as worms, um, sow bugs, um, there are all kinds of decomposers that that's their whole job is just to break down the organic matter. And so all these things exist. And I just thought if there was a way to do that, in gardens as well, that would be really beneficial. So I started thinking about ways that we could make somewhat <laughs> natural spaces in our own backyards. And so that includes sometimes adding the compost just to add a, that protective layer to add that microbiology, but then also adding some sort of um, mulch of sorts. And so that could just be the, the leaves, like I said, or the grass clippings that are naturally already available to, to everybody everywhere in every garden. Um, just leaving that in place. And then that starts to attract all the beneficial critters that you, you could possibly ever want. And so that just makes a lot of sense to me because Mother Nature already has this sorted out. So if you just kind of follow her guidelines, um, your garden will be beautiful. Mother Nature is amazing. She is. <laughs> I bet your uh, philosophy degree goes quite hand in hand with gardening. <laughs> well, I'm glad you said that. I've been thinking it's kind of a useless degree over the years, but you, you might be right. <laughs> <laughs> now, you mentioned your mom, and we know that she's uh, not just your mom. She is uh, a notable gardening expert on her own, Donna Balzer from HGTV. So I'm guessing you were probably born with a yeah. green thumb. Well, that's partly why I did my philosophy degree, because I grew up with this horticulture mom who, you know, for fun and as punishment, we always had to end up in the garden. So that's what I was like, whatever I do, I'm not doing gardening. <laughs> and so I went off and got this degree in Nova Scotia, and then I came back and started a gardening. <laughs> you know. I love it. What's the best gardening advice she ever gave you? Oh, you know, she hasn't given me a lot of, like, specific advice. But I do know that she always talked about, she said the reason she rented out a giant plot of um, farmland for a while when we were kids was because she just wanted us to eat organically. And she, at the time, in the early 80s, she couldn't buy organic food. So she knew the value of that. And so she rented out a piece of land just so that she could grow her own food. And I think also just not being scared of of just trying. So my mom is really good at experimenting in gardens. Like she'll say, oh, I'm just going to grow a fig. You know, she's like, I'm just going to take a cutting from somebody's fig and just grow it. And she doesn't necessarily know how to do these things, but she has the confidence to try. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's where a lot of gardeners go, you know, go wrong is that they, they they need to know all the details before they try they're like how do i grow something i'm like i don't know just put it in some soil put a seed in soil and see what happens and then that's how you start to learn 
So I think she kind of always gave me that advice of just try it, see what happens, and then you learn from that. And, and I think that that's been really valuable for me. Nice. Okay, let's get some more mm-hmm. soil tips from you. What should we do in the fall when we're cleaning up our gardens and yards? Should we remove debris like leaves? Mm, yeah, I love that question. So I, because I come from this natural gardening sort of philosophy, uh, I really believe, so in my own garden, and I'll tell you what I do in my client's garden, but what I do in my own garden is that I leave it all. So the leaves on my lawn, I tend to rake onto the beds just so that I'm not going to cause any, you know, mold in the lawn, etc. Um, but I want to keep them on site. And the more that you keep these things on site, the more the biology will work faster for you. Like there'll be more and more of that biology and worms to break them down. So if if you find you rake everything onto your garden bed and it's not breaking down, you probably haven't been doing it long enough. So <laughs> maybe you need to haul some of those leaves away. I'm not sure. But if they do start to break down quickly, you'll notice that they just vanish really within a few weeks sometimes. It's really miraculous. So I do tend to rake the leaves onto my bed. And then I also tend to leave a lot of the stalks, like if I have sunflowers or delphiniums, which are fairly thick-stemmed um, flowers, I tend to leave those in place. I know a lot of people like them to be tucked back. So the garden looks like it's been put away for the winter. But I tend to leave those because they're often really good overwintering sites for all kinds of beneficial critters, whether that be the pollinators or, yeah, usually the pollinators are the ones that are hiding out in those stems. But um, So I tend to leave them. And then it's in the spring when I do the big cleanup. So that's when I will cut things back. And I just cut them back and I often chop and drop, which means just chop them on site, let them break down on, on the soil. Of course, with a gardening business, um, you know, and they, people want things done beautifully. They want to fit in their neighborhoods. They want it to look spectacular, like things would look in downtown Edmonton or Calgary or wherever you are. Mm-hmm. And so some, some clients really do request that we, we clean it up and that we remove lots of that debris. And so we will do that. But what we'll do to replace that missing organic matter is that we'll replace with a thick layer of compost, so an inch or two of compost in the spring, just so that there's that that microbiology and there's that place for critters to to be cozy and so sometimes we have to add an artificial natural <laughs> substitute right when it comes to composting what's what's the easiest way to get started oh with composting well you need to know that you need like green materials so things like fresh cut lawn is like that green material but if you cut your lawn and you let those dry out now they're considered brown, like they're considered in the other category. So you need the greens, which is anything fresh, anything that kind of has that moisture still in it. So anything from your kitchen, for example, any of your banana peels or your potato peels, that's all the greens, we're going to call them. And then you also need to have the browns, and you need to tend, you tend to need to have more browns than greens, because you don't want to end up with this wet, sloppy, stinky pile. So the browns tend to moderate that, make it more dry, uh, encourage aerobic rather than anaerobic critters. So you want the aerobic critters in there, the ones that like it drier. So you encourage them by having more browns than greens. And then you also have to have some kind of air. And so to get air in the pile, I often just suggest that turning the pile is the best way. So there are composters or composting types of machines that will turn. If you just like kind of push the, the barrel around, it'll, it'll rotate naturally. That gets the air in. But you also need some kind of moisture. So you need some kind of water. Sometimes you need to water it yourself. Sometimes the greens will add enough moisture. But those are the four ingredients. The browns, the greens, the water, and the air. So you need all four of those things. And it should smell good. So that's a good way to test your pile at any time. If it's starting to smell stinky, um, if it's distasteful in any way, like it shouldn't ever trigger your nose. You know, It should never trigger you to think, oh my gosh, that's not good. Your neighbor should never be complaining about a stinky compost pile. It should always smell like the floor of a, or like the floor of a forest or, or something really fresh like that. It, it should make you smile when you smell it. Right. And I do have a son, a 13 year old, who every day when he leaves the house, he takes a scoop of my compost pile and just stuffs it in his nose and gives it a good old sniff because he loves the smell of it. And that's what you should be aspiring towards. That's awesome. Yeah. And when should you start composting? I've heard that it's best to actually start in the fall or winter, your compost pile? The best time to start is today. So just whatever you have in your kitchen, whatever you have available right away, just get that into a heap. Um, I know what you're saying about the fall, though. I think that that's because often that's when we have a lot of garden things available. So we'll have maybe all the leaves from our trees or or whatever. But you can start any, any day, any time. Today would be perfect. Um, <laughs> Just make sure that you have the right kind of amounts of, of greens and browns. So just make sure you have a good pile of browns available and then add in those greens and then just keep it turned and it should be warm. 
and smell good. <laughs> You're on the right track. Okay. And are weeds good for your soil as in like keeping things natural or is this something that we're going to have to get used to seeing yellow dandelions in our yards and gardens? Is that good for the compost pile or is that good for your gardening in general? Gardening in general. Well, they often indicate things, right? So you mentioned dandelions. and If you have a lot of dandelions, they are really good at breaking up tight soils. So if you look somewhere that's been trampled a lot, or if you look in a parking lot, what's coming up through the cracks in the cement, it's often dandelions because they have these really tough roots that can push down through anything. If you look at like a bus stop where everyone's constantly trampling around in that area or at a school field, um, again, really compact areas will almost attract the dandelions because they're there to do their job, which is to break up the soil and then the soil. So they can be beneficial in that sense, or they can just kind of trigger something in you to say, oh, why has this weed turned up? You can often read the weeds, I guess. If, I, I don't know how to say that. But you can look at the weeds, see what you have, and then look into what their benefits are, like what they offer or what they're doing. Something like clover, for example, is, is adding nitrogen to the soil, which is a really beneficial thing, or it's fixing nitrogen in the soil. So it's actually making for better growing conditions for future crops. Like maybe your potatoes need more nit- nitrogen, or maybe your peas or, or whoever needs more nitrogen. So that is a beneficial crop. So it really depends on what types of weeds you're getting and what their benefits or overall job is. And looking into that, <laughs> getting to the bottom of it. Right. And then you can always amend it. You could dig out the weeds and add compost. If, if you didn't think it's too compact, the compost can help loosen the conditions as well. You know, so there are different ways to approach that. Right. And how long does it usually take to amend your soil back to health? Oh gosh, I've seen it happen so fast. Like the thing about nature is that she works really fast. Um, well, fast is a funny term. I mean, we, uh, gosh, I heard this a few years ago. It was like, they do figure that you can attract, I think it was within two years. God, this is not a great quote, but within two years that you can attract all the microbiology that, that your garden will need naturally if you just start adding compost and if you just let this, the leaves sit. Um, I bought my house that we're currently in three years ago, and I recently had to dig out one of my flower beds to, to put you know, a deck extension. And the soil was unbelievably beautiful. And when we moved in here three years ago, it was completely compact, completely dandelion filled. It was just soil and a hedge. And I have been growing vegetables in this little front patch for a while. And the soil, when I dug it out the other day, was just spectacular. It's been just under three years since we moved in here. The other thing is last year we dug out, um, a couple clients had called us and they said, we really need all these weeds dug out. We'd love to plant something. I said, well, let's dig the weeds this summer. We'll amend it. And then we'll plant things this spring. So last summer, we dug them out. We added a good couple inches of compost on top. This summer, when we went to plant those gardens, we never dug in better soil. So it's really amazing how quickly all those little microbes can work as like essentially like little tillers of the soil as well. So they essentially till your soil, making it really soft and fluffy. And so we dug holes like it was, it was no trouble whatsoever. It was so easy to dig through. And that was a really good indicator. And that just happened last fall that we put the compost down. And now it's only been about six months or so since that happened. So it can, in my mind, that's really fast. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> sounds fast. Overnight or instant, but, yeah. Um, six months, a year, two years, that's all fairly quick. And then you have something that will be beautiful forever. You know, it'll, as long as you keep amend or keep, keep up that uh, organic matter that's going in, um, it'll never get to the point where it's driving you crazy. So what can you say to, uh, what advice can you give to gardeners who want to see results like right away, like tomorrow, next week? Yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> 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 Gardening is, it has to be a labor of love to a degree, you know, and you do have to have a little bit of patience. You do have to work with what's available. Um, I think the best and fastest way is by adding thick layers of compost. Don't get shy with compost. Always choose a high quality compost. So just because somebody's charging you the highest price doesn't mean that's the highest quality. So don't buy plastic bag wrapped compost. That's my number one tip because that means that there are no microbes in that. They okay. will get, they'll be, you know, it'll be, they'll suffocate in there. Also, don't buy any compost which is smelly. And I know we've already, already talked about this, but if it smells bad, it's not a good compost to be adding because it's that, those, those bad smells are the anaerobic critters, the ones who like it wet. And so if they like it wet, it means that they're, they're, they're going to cause damage. Like there's um, some nematodes, some root eating nematodes. So you can imagine what they're doing in your garden. They're eating your root. <laughs> so if you're adding this stinky anaerobic compost, chances are really good that you're getting these roots eating nematodes in there, which are going to damage your garden. So again, use your nose, add a good quality product. Um, do be, do be patient. Like do, you do have to wait. So I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but there's no instant overnight 
not in a natural garden anyway. There's no there's overnight to suggest or even nothing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chelsea, for joining us on Good to Grow. All right. Thanks for having me. That was Chelsea Anderson, owner of Chelsea's Garden Solutions in Calgary. You can learn more by visiting chelseagardens.com. Growing your own food or flowers? Drop us a line at goodtogrow at ama.ab.ca. We might feature you in a segment we call The Plot Thickens. For this segment, we want to hear about your garden, whether you're a newbie like me or a master green thumb. We want to know what you're growing, what gardening means to you, or any questions you might have about growing food and flowers in Alberta. In this installment of The Plot Thickens, we meet a gardener who lives in downtown Edmonton. Hi, my name is Elise and I run the Instagram account at Balcony Gardener YEG. I started my balcony garden because I did a couple tomato plants last year and I grew up on an acreage with a big garden and I always wanted to grow things like that and I thought, I have a balcony, why can't I do that here? I was a little devastated back in the beginning of the spring when a giant windstorm wiped out a lot of my garden, but I did manage to get some seeds back in the ground and try again. So the things I'm growing now, I have, I'm just looking at it right now on my balcony room, my window, I have about six balcony boxes. So in one I'm growing arugula and uh, kind of a dark purple lettuce, which is very pretty. I have three boxes of tomato plants, I have about three tomato plants in each box. I have a box of basil, which I harvest almost on a daily basis because it's been so hot lately. One of strawberry plants, and then I have a geranium, I have some fuchsias, and I have peas that are climbing the railing of our balcony, as well as a pepper plant and a couple of herbs. And my balcony really measures uh, probably 10 feet by 5 feet, maybe, to give you just an indication of what you can grow in such a small space. Um, Anyway, and to get back up after your garden has been decimated by wind and learn that when you're higher up, you gotta deal with those issues. So um, keep gardening and good luck. Thanks, Elise. Share your gardening adventures or questions with us and you might be featured in an upcoming installment of The Plot Thickens. Send an email or voice recording to goodtogrow at ama.ab.ca. Thanks for listening to AMA's Good to Grow. I'm Sandra Speronis. Happy gardening! Good to Grow is produced by the Alberta Motor Association. If you enjoyed this episode, follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. For even more gardening tips and tales, join our Facebook community, AMA Good to Grow.